as, as I travelled, one of the things that I began to observe was what is borne out in, in research today. Research tells us that in Australian society, um, while there are a handful that you know, will struggle with food on the table or a, a roof over their head, um, you know, usually that, that there will be other reasons for that, be it mental health or drug addiction or other addictions, gambling, that type of thing. Um, in Australia, generally the, the, the greatest common need as such is for community. People, particularly in the cities, are lonely. They may, you know, be surrounded by people at work, on the train, you know, wherever it be, but they're lonely. They, they're separated from healthy community. And I actually believe as a church, it's a tremendous opportunity. And, and I think one of the things I've been challenged in my thinking as I've watched what's happening in Brazil is, you know, how can we you know, be creative in how we go about in, in making those connections for people? It was interesting as, as we travelled, sometimes we would stay in caravan parks, sometimes at showgrounds, you know, wherever it would, would, would be that we could get a, a hot shower and um, hot shower is important. Um, and it was probably, it, it started at Lightning Ridge when we were there. Um, one of the, it might have even been Sabbath afternoon, the, this lady came round on her bike and she said, oh, we're, we're bush poets. And there's, there's two of us doing a presentation this afternoon at, at um, four o'clock. And um, so we didn't go that afternoon, but Sunday afternoon we thought, oh, well, let's, let's roll up and see what this bush poet thing is about. Actually, it was kind of fun. It was genuine bush poetry and, um, you know, it went for about an hour. But half the caravan park turned up for this thing. And then once the, the you know, the bush poets had done their thing, all these people from all over the, the, the place sit and talk and enter into community. Um, now, if you were cynical, you'd say, you know, four o'clock in these places is beer o'clock because, you know, everyone's got their, their tinny or their glass of wine or whatever it be, and, you know, that, that's just how it goes. But then we moved on. Um, you know, a little further down the road, we, we stopped at Roma. Um, the, the, you could stay in the, the gun club there, so we, you know, they had it set up in their car park, so we stayed in the gun club, and as we're booking in, oh, four o'clock's happy hour. Well, anyway, we didn't bother about it at Roma, but actually, when we're at Lightning Ridge, sitting there in the artesian bore bars, we had met at church another lady, another Adventist lady. Turned out she had a Melbourne connection. Um, she'd spent many years at Seddon Church, Katerina. And Katerina, what on earth possessed her to move to Lightning Ridge? I, 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 good place to visit. I, I, I'm not moving there just yet. Um, but she had moved to Lightning Ridge. And essentially, what I saw her doing was starting a church in the Boar Baths. Because... Once we'd met her at church, she said, oh, did you get to the boar bars? And we said, actually, yeah, we did go last night. Oh, she said, I'll look out for you tonight. And sure enough, she was there. And as we started chatting to her, she turns to a couple next to her who were also somewhat new to Lightning Ridge. And he was, you know, this tough, big, tattooed bloke, gentle as they come. You wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. But once he realised I was a pastor, he couldn't stop talking. And it was, I believe in God, but I can't stand church. You know, we, 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 we see that sometimes. And so we talked about God and church and, you know, as because we, we were there a few nights and I think we probably talked for a couple of nights and as I was leaving and, you know, who knows if we'll ever see him again, I said, look, 
Katerina will look after you and I reckon you'll be at her church one day. Um, and he laughed and didn't, you know, didn't disagree. But you know, then there was another man that had helped Katerina in terms of setting up where she was living and she was being a missionary in Lightning Ridge in those boar bars. She would go every night and she was making connections with people. She was going. Um, pretty simple really, isn't it? Um, so as, as you know, we drove out of Lightning Ridge, we thought in many ways that's the community, a community point in, in that town. So, you know, Roma, they had their happy hour. We got up to Carnarvon Gorge, spectacular place. Um, you know, we did the walk right up, right up to the top. Um, between me and my, my 16-year-old, we carried our, um, our three-year-old most of the way because it was a long, it was about, by the time we got up to the, the, the end and back, it's about a 20K um, walk. And um, sure enough, happy hour, four o'clock. Um, and I thought, oh, look, I'll just wander down to have a look. And lo and behold, probably a good half the people in the camp turn out and sit around for happy hour. You know, they have their drinks and whatnot. And, and you know, one of the, the park rangers get, got up and took, gave a bit of a talk about the things you could find in Carnarvon Gorge. But people just wanted to come together and mingle. One of the nights we were there, we went and sat around. We, we got a fire going. They had a few communal fireplaces around. We went and sat around this communal fireplace. Got chatting to a couple. Turned out she was the director of the Queensland Theatre Company. He was a lawyer for the ABC. But just out there, they were going hiking the next day and started talking about the world and where things were going and fascinating people. Values not that different, concerns not that different to what we might talk about. And the journey goes on. You know, we stopped at, I, I forget the, the first place we were when State of Origin was on. I couldn't care less about State of Origin, but up in that part of the world, State of Origin's it. I know those that like rugby, you know. We stopped at, at Lucinda. Now, Lucinda is just um, north of, of Townsville, sugarcane country. And at Lucinda, there is this jetty that goes out where um, bulk sugar is exported from. All the sugar in that area is, is exported out of this facility. Um, the, the jetty that goes out is just, I think it's 5.2 kilometres long. It is awesome to see. Um, it is so long that in building it, they have to take into account the curvature of the earth. And at the end, it is two metres lower than where it leaves the shoreline. Um, just this incredible facility. But it was there, again, you know, when we rolled in. Oh, you know, tomorrow night we've got state of origin celebrations. And you wander around the caravan park and they've got blues flags and they've got Queensland flags. And you think, man, they take this pretty seriously. But you know what? It was just an excuse for community. People gathered around in big numbers. We saw it again in Rockhampton with the final state of origin. Big numbers of people just gathering together. And it actually made me think, you know, one of the, the, the quotes from Ellen White was, you know, about um, doing evangelism in, in um, you know, areas, and I don't know that tourist was the word, but in those sort of areas. You know, you've got grey nomads and others travelling around Australia almost constantly, sitting in places where they're relaxed and ready to listen. Makes you think. And then I came back to thinking about why are these people willing to sit in these sort of environments, in these sort of places? Oh, Lucinda, we came across um, a couple of people there. They're from um, Tarelgan. They spend six months of the year at Lucinda. He had what, what made us notice was he had these big pot plant 
planter things out the front of his caravan with corn and capsicum and things like that in them. As soon as he arrives there, he plants all these things because he's there long enough to harvest them. And so he stays there until he harvests them, misses all of winter, and then you know, they hook up their caravan again and go home. Um, actually, half of Victoria, I think, was up there. But it made me think, you know, we, we talk about purpose and we talk about wanting to create community, but if you want to talk about the enemy of purpose and community, it's division. It's probably one of the reasons that you know, some of these people look at church and say, yes, we love God, but church is not for me. Um, and it got me thinking, actually, Scripture says some pretty tough things on division, and I won't go for the, the harshest of the, the statements, but I do want to read you um, a couple of the things. Actually, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20, and I won't take the time to go there, it actually has the, the list of the acts of the sinful nature. And one of the things on that list is division. So, let me just skip through a handful of texts. Let me come first to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 verses 17 and 18. And it says there, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Paul, Paul does not mince his words. There's another one that I, well, you know, just do a word search on division in the New Testament. Um, there was one, one I read while I was looking through them, and it may have been the one in Jude, and it basically says, warn them twice, warn them three times, and if they don't listen, get rid of them. That's my, you know, that's my interpretation of it. That's, it, 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 it's quite tough. But when you think about it, you know, what diminishes our witness as a Christian community? That's got to be one of them. One of the texts that, that you, know, is, is, you know, if you talk about a purpose text, one of the texts that has always stood out for me and I'll, I'll repeat time and time again is John 13, 35. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And if we're bickering and fighting and scratching each other's eyes out, well, what's that tell anyone? It probably just says keep clear. In 1 Corinthians, of course, you come to this church in Corinth that is factionalised and divided. I'm not going to read all of it, but I, I just want to remind you of some of the, the passage there. 1 Corinthians chapter two, and um, uh, chapter 1 and verse 10. Paul says there, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may, may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. He's an idealist. That's, that's the goal. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. You know, how did that happen? Um... Did he get a letter? Did, did he have a conversation with somebody who's Chloe's household? Um, you know, how much weight would you put on that? You know, when somebody comes to you and, and, oh, you know, this is happening, you need to do something about this. How do you deal with it? Anyway, Paul, what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. They're all trying to top each other. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? And I love this next little bit. He says, I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you. I accept Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say you were baptised into my name. Oh, yes, I also baptised the of household of Stephanus. Oh, beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied 
of its power. Paul is coming back to, here's my purpose, to preach the gospel. And this division thing, goodness me, people, that doesn't, you know, this is not what we're about. And then he goes on, he, he kind of has, has this broad excursus and then in chapter 3, I'll, I'll pick it up at verse 3, he says, you are still worldly for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? After all, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants? For whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labour, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. God's building. One purpose. We are God's fellow workers. There's another passage that I want to come to and we could put a very modern spin on this passage. It's over in the book of Titus. In Titus chapter 3, He talks about a few different things and then in verse 9 he, he picks up a little more. He says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Ah, this is the text I was thinking of actually. We could put a modern spin on this one and say, avoid foolish controversies and geneal you know, maybe not genealogies, but avoid foolish controversies about the Trinity or conspiracy theories or weird prophetic interpretations or having to impose particular health views on people or, you know, insert whatever challenge that you're facing that has been bringing division and it would fit in this passage. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Here it is, warn a divisive person once then warn him a second time, and after that have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Please, I'm not telling you to go and... <laughs> you, anyway, we will let Paul speak for himself and let the word of God stand on its own. Let me come to the passage in Jude. I wasn't going to go to this one, but I will. Because I want to finish with, with this one. Because again, it addresses that. And it's really coming back to being aware that there are enemies of purpose. Our purpose is to spread the gospel. Our purpose is to be fellow workers with Christ, as Paul says. And we can be waylaid of that, from that purpose through procrastination, but also our church can be shaken from its purpose through division. And it's not that there won't be times when we don't see eye to eye on things. You know, we, we are in this world, we are human beings who at times will have different points of view. It is inevitable and that's why I come back to that passage in John 13, 35. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. It's not that you always agree with one another, but it's how we go about those moments when we see things differently. It is possible 
to see things differently at times, but to still love one another and to show that. That is an impressive thing for the world. That, I believe, is something, as people come and experience that, that they will be drawn to it and, and you know, go to Parliament House, you look at people disagreeing, they don't exactly love one another in the way they go about it. Imagine if that was people's experience with church. Anyway, let's have a read of Jude towards the end of the, the, the book. Verse 17, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, and Paul's a little more positive, um, well, no, Jude, Jude's a little more positive than the, the note that Paul just struck in, in Titus there. Um, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Notice that focus on, on Jesus. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To, show, to, to others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And then we come to this famous doxology and this is what we'll finish with and, and pray. To him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, even though it's early on a Sunday morning and... Maybe most of us wouldn't usually be quite so alert at this hour. We, we thank you for the opportunity to draw together again in this special place. We just pray that as we go about leadership in our churches, that we not suffer from these enemies of purpose, be it procrastination or division. But Lord, if we are faced with, with division, we pray that we would take into account the counsel of Scripture that we would draw people back to that purpose that you have put us here on earth for. And Lord, that above all, we would unswervingly hold to Jesus Christ, that our eyes would always be fixed on you, and that in the process, we would show that love of Christ to all around us, whether times be good or whether times be difficult. Thanks, Lord. We, we are so grateful for all that you have done for us. We thank you for your love for us. And may your Holy Spirit go with us as we go through this day. Thanks for the meal that we're about to share together. Bless the food. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.